Hi, welcome back to the Gwembassy. I'm Gwem. Today I've got a very special guest for you, Paul Soulsby of Soulsby Synths. I know Paul for some years. I did a gig with him back when he was in the electro pop band Trademark, and since then he's gone on to form his own independent synthesizer company. And he's released synths like the App Megatron, which I've featured on a few videos in the channel. He's got some really interesting views about engineering, designing new synths, and music in general. I'm sure you're going to find this very interesting. So I wanted to ask you the beginning, because when we first met, I remember mm. the night extremely clearly. It was mm. uh, an event called UK Fresh. Yes, yeah, in uh, Islington. Yeah, somewhere in Islington. And uh, I met you and, and Ollie and Piney Gurr and, uh, and a bunch of other people for the first time. It was a really great event. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, you were in Trademark, which it was... Uh, or still is, I suppose, electro pop kind of. Um... Yes, yeah, yeah, electro pop band. But uh, what what happened, you know, with you prior to that? I joined Tromark as a proper member in nineteen ninety nine. So prior to that, it was really just home mucking about at home. I got a, a MSX when I was eight, yeah. and, and programmed music in BASIC on that mm -hmm. three voices. Uh, and then an Amiga when I was about 13 and, but I didn't go down the classic tracker route mm. at all. Right. I used a program called Quartet, which was almost like, um, notation software. Mm. It was a weird hybrid, sort of hybrid tracker notation, but none of the normal input that was, it, you know, you put mu the notes on the stave, mm. uh, the samples on the stave. Yeah. Um, so I did some music in that and then... I also did stuff with a, a four-track recorder from school. We did stuff from that, so I learned all about layering stuff up, how to squeeze seven tracks out of it by bouncing down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did plenty of that. After that, got my first PC in 1995, Windows 95 version A, uh, and a Turtle Beach Trope Plus. Uh, That's a good sound card. Yeah, we, we maxed that out with, um, was it two or four megabytes of sample ROM, which I used loads, Cakewalk version 5, mm -hmm. the, the middling one, was it called Pro, I think, Pro, Professional was the middle one, mm -hmm. so Cakewalk 5 Professional, and then I just did that all the way through to trademark songs in Cakewalk using the Turtle Beach, oh, and of course getting the Juno 60 for mm. my 18th birthday. Was the, uh... So was that <laughs> electro pop or were you doing like other styles of music as well? I tried doing everything. I tried doing dance stuff, but mm. what was rubbish at it then, rubbish at it now, it's just I should give up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, like everyone was bringing in all these jungle mixes on cassette tapes, mm. and uh, at that point, it was late 90s, so it was peak, peak drum and bass and jungle. Um, yeah. I was trying to do stuff like it using the Turtle Beach, but I, I didn't really have a clue. I, 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 when I first got that, I bought Sound on Sound, and I didn't understand a word that was going on in, in and then I switched to future music and then mm. suddenly I basically learned everything through that I, yeah. it was a bit more you know it helped you into the how to do it a little bit more so plenty of buying future music plenty of sampling stuff writing stuff but a lot of it would get quite it, I was really into Jean-Michel Jarre mm. um, at that point and then I had all the history of the prog rock stuff which I was really into so I was creating all these songs like in 11.8 and uh <laughs> with multiple sections. Mm. Key thing about Cakewalk Professional 5, you only had four tracks of audio, but you could dump the clips on top of one another and it would merge them. Right. So, but you could then, you just have to know that there was an audio clip under the clip that, on, on, that just, was on top. Mm. <laughs> and if you dragged it out of the way, you could get to it again. <laughs> So yeah, it would still be. <laughs> it was a weird little thing. I think they didn't think anyone would ever t tolerate operating it like that but I did I'd have all the, I'd have like the main tracks that laid down and then I'd drop little spot effects mm. on top of that which would obviously you could still see them uh, and the tro Tropo Plus was featuring heavy and then then Juno came in for my 18th birthday mm. I did a track that was nearly entire Juno uh, the Juno just blew my mind and you still got the Juno still, and it became like my main tro uh, synth for trademark for touring yeah, um, so when you joined Trademark, it seems like 
while everybody else was moving from hard hardware to software, you were moving from software to hardware. Is yeah, that a fair? Yeah, I, I was very anti-digital at that point. Mm. Um, I know that the first trademark album I worked on, I went round to see Ollie and Stu, and they put all these um, sampled strings on it, and I insisted that they were all taken off <laughs> and replaced with Juno strings. Uh, which I think I only got my way with a couple of songs. But, I mean, at that point, I was really, really snobbish. I thought the DX7 was the worst synth ever made, which is ironic since I absolutely... Well, <laughs> two digital synths. I abs I've got yeah. a DX7 Mark II sat at home. I've got plenty of digital synths. But at that point, I was very, very snobbish. And it's funny. It makes me laugh when you see, like, people my age then, so, you know, kids around 18, 19, that on forums that have that opinion now, like, oh, it must be analog. I'm like, oh, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you first think, I, I remember, because I was using, first at first, Fast Tracker 2 on, on PC, and I had a um, Sound Blaster AWE32. Oh, uh, yeah, my friend had one of those. They were great. Yeah, Creative Labs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was happy with that, but I remember the first time I tried my first analog synth, which was a Novation base station, which I think you used in Trademark as well. Mm, yeah, Stu had It was like, station. oh my God, this is so fat. Then you kind of like addicted to analog for a bit, but I don't know. Yeah, They're both so, good, aren't they? Yeah, I, I remember playing with the base station. I remember thinking that was really, really good. Um, mm. And we had a Yamaha W, was it a W7 that Ollie had? And he would build whole songs on that, but I'd then try and like <laughs> get rid of that. But the thing was, it could do lots of sounds that nothing else could. It could do those crazy sort of late 90s distortion, you know, metally distortion yeah, on a yeah, synth yeah, sounds, yeah. you know, sort of that kind of thing. So it could do plenty of things like that. But um, yeah, the bass station was great. That was a very, very good synth. And I played on the the, the, the new one recently as well. Um, you know, they brought one out two or three years yeah. ago. And that was very good. So when you were in Trademark, I know you did... Well, I, we played a gig together, but I know you played hundreds of shows and, and tours and stuff, mm. right? Do you have any highlights from from those days? Well, the Human League tour was probably the, the, the pinnacle because mm. uh, that, was, that would have been 2004, December 2004. That was because... All the label interest was sort of peaking, mm. press interest was peaking, and then the tour came up, so it was all coming together. But like with so many bands, it, it you know it just wasn't enough to to see it through to being a, a career forever for for me. Mm. Um, I don't really know. I guess I guess we were still just too interested in doing what we wanted to do. Even though we had songs that people were saying were hits, we never were, we didn't write them to be hits. It wasn't like, oh, we must write a hit. <laughs> uh, we were just like, oh, let's try this. Oh, let's put this mm. weird slide guitar or this weird piano sound. And <laughs> oh, <but laughs> never really entered my mind. <laughs> it gives it integrity, though, right? Weirdly, if Ollie could mix all those songs now, it would sound <laughs> 20 times better. <laughs> I think we, we got very stuck over minor details rather than bigger things with it when we were mixing the songs. Mm. Um, but I think just because, I, I think it generally worked. I think we always got there in the end. I, I, there's no mixes. I, I still feel the hi-hats are too loud on toe the line, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> whenever I, I think about that, it, it, it annoys me. But other than that, I think every mix ended up okay. It was fine. Mm. Very, really didn't think about stereo in the right way at all at that point. Mm. Um, by the final album, we we sort of got more on track with knowing that stereo width was so important. Also, for making a song loud, I think I think we were almost like in the in the noughties, It was like you got to put everything down the middle, and it's got to be really dry and mm. tight and punchy, and that's what makes it in heavy sounding. But then, then I think over time, then it switched, and then it was like by the last album, we we're like, no, we need to make things really wide. Put big reverbs on things and that will make it sound intense <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it all it sort of changed our opinions on things over time mm. did you have any like disasters on tour like did the juno 60 ever blow a fuse or something oh yeah we had um human league tour reading i uh, we'd have a racket of synths at the back and then our main synths out the front 
and I started trusting what you know, and the 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 um, I did a main bass line that that is the song at the start, <laughs> and uh, nothing came out. So I tried to reset the micro modular uh, with my hand. You know, this is on the sh show, final song of the show, mm. or Reading Hexagon, <laughs> and um, <laughs> instead of. <laughs> instead of resetting it I actually just rip all the cables out and I put them back in again <laughs> so, so I'm like it's not it's without actually now completely dismantling it and getting back in to it there's no way I'm getting that back together so I took <laughs> went to my trusty Juno 60 and which was already doing presets mm. on, on, on the song and just quickly created the sounds mm. on the fly for the bass line started on the Juno and then when I needed to go to the other, the preset sound, mm. I'll just push the preset and play that, mm. and then go back to manual and start mm. doing the bass again. And somehow I got through it, but that was a real panic. <laughs> uh, I really, really was panicking. <laughs> but stuff went wrong all the time because we had all these props and stuff that would always break down. So uh, yeah, the the light. I think there was. <laughs> I built so we had two iterations of a giant Perspex mm. plug. And I just created the second iteration that was supposed to be a little bit stronger and a bit cleaner looking. Uh, I don't think the glue had fully set on the final parts. And uh, Ollie goes backstage to pick the, the plug up mm. <laughs> and he tripped up and it, it just went, just smashed into a million pieces. So that was the uh, end of that plug. But I mean, it all, I got it working again afterwards, but it, yeah, <laughs> that was, that was, that, that. So it didn't feature the Perspex plug. <laughs> Trademark was starting to wind down. You announced to to people, to your mates, that it was probably going to be the last album. And then mm. I remember meeting you in Bristol at a house party and we, we had a catch up. And you were saying to me that you'd got the MSX out again and you were doing some programming on it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I sort of come back to it every now and then and I never finish... I, I've always said I'd create this sort of synth controller for, for, for the internal chip. And I think, yeah, when I was in Bristol, I got quite far in that I'd created menus, uh, you know, a, a menu system with icons and things to, to interact with it. Um, but because I was writing in BASIC on an MSX, it, it, it just couldn't ever refresh fast enough. to. Mm. Uh, I'd have had to have gone into assembler. It was the only way it would have ever have worked. And I, I, it just didn't. It got to that point where just you know every trudging through the menus was so sluggish, mm. and I had no way other than learning assembler, which I wasn't really up for, and so that was the end of that. But I still do love the MSX. Still got a couple at home. So. Yeah, it is a great machine. Mm. So what was in between the MSX and like this thing, the original at Megatron? What was the the step that you took? Um. So buying lots of real synths, so I learned, and then obviously I, I went beyond my little snobbishness for analog. I've, I've got samplers, I've got um, uh, digital synths from all eras. Uh, I obviously been a recording engineer for two years in a studio that had dozens and dozens of synthesizers from all eras. And I'd stay back and I'd learn how to program, you know, even a mm. Korg Trinity. I created my own patches on a Korg Trinity. Oh, that's <laughs> pretty impressive because uh, that's not the easiest synth to... Especially uh... if you just dial a sound. <laughs> but, I mean, it has it all in there if you're willing to dig. Mm. Uh, so I thought I'd give it a go. I always felt... I, I took all these synths that I loathed and thought I could tame them. And sometimes it worked. I think the OB-12 I did manage to tame a bit. Uh, I spent a weekend with the manual mm. of that trying to make a good sound and I... I worked out tricks and things for making it sound interesting and not just like this weird distorted reverb. The Trinity was never good. I, I really tried everything to get a good sound out of that. It's just a horrible preset machine. Right. Did you um, ever try a cool Prophecy? Yeah, well, Prophecy was, yeah, we used that on a few trademark songs because there was one in the, the Birmingham studio. It's a weird old synth because you, you go through it and everyone thinks of it as being. Um, you know, that synth the Prodigy used for all mm. those roaring bass lines and things. And you go through, you use it, and it's like, oh, saxophone, just going, pa, 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 pa. <laughs> like, is this the same synth? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, yeah, and violin and things like that. So you have to really play with the settings before you 
start to do stuff that's interesting with it. So yeah. you're trying all these synths, but I mean, it's a ballsy move to set up your own synth company. Uh, there must have been like a trigger that really pushed you over the edge and said, right, I'm gonna, I've got this idea. Uh, <laughs> no, it was really, it just sort of happened. <laughs> I think I think it was um, so. I decided I did. I worked for from two thousand and four five ish through to two thousand and thirteen um, on game shows, mm. and there had been a couple of shows that involved Arduino's. Mm. Uh, but I decided I didn't want to do it full time anymore, so I stopped at the end of twenty twelve, and then I just started playing with it. I didn't have a plan though of what I was going to do. I knew it would be music related somehow or synthesizer related, but it certainly wasn't you will create a synthesizer company and it'll do 8-bit synths or anything mm. like that. Just started tinkering around and then within a week or so I had some basic sounds coming out of it. It, it took about a year. I think it was six months to create the audio engine and then another six months to do all the other stuff that surrounds it like the manual, the box, the mm. enclosure, all the other things took another six months. So February 2014 it was launched. Right, brilliant. Who do you think, um, you know, has taken the app Megatron to their hearts the most? I think there was this big thing that it was going to be chip tune people initially. Mm. It's not been the case overall, actually. Mm. In fact, I think I think plenty of musicians just want it as a little extra sound to the pal their palette mm. um, because it's a small synth and it can just sit there and it's like, oh, I want a little glitchy bleepy sound. Just plug that in and I've got one. <laughs> uh, I think the chip tune community is maybe not been that much as you'd imagine, even though it does that sort of sound, because I think I think so much of the chip tune people are like, well, well if it's not an 80s home computer mm. chip making the sound, I don't want to know, <laughs> which it isn't. It's a modern day 8-bit chip. Not a, mm. not a, and it's not. It's a microcontroller, not a, a synth chip. Mm. It's, the, the whole thing is done on a microcontroller that, that really does audio almost as a, a side thing not mm. not not a it's not designed for sound do you think it might be because this is a sound module and chip tune people like to have like an all-in-one with like a tracker and stuff yeah i think i think chip tune people uh feel most comfortable you know mm. doing uh you know sort of something on a game boy like nano loop mm. or something or uh maximizer or something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's 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 just all there, and you know you're controlling that one chip, and you've got complete control of it. I've heard plenty of chip tune people who do like using this synth, mm. but um, not quite in the same way. It's not quite the same scene, I don't think, for using this. I think you're more likely to just use this as a synth on a song than a, than a... Yeah, I mean, it's got its own character. It's not, for me, it's not quite like chip tune because with chip tune, you associate it with, oh, it's an arpeggio, it's an arpeggiated chord. Because this is sort of like, you know, it's analog modeling as well, but deliberately, well, it's 8-bit, so it's deliberately mm -hmm. gritty. So it kind of sounds really good for like industrial sounds and it's got the bass boost, so it's really warm as well. Yes, yeah. That was the bass boost was literally, this needs a bit of analog warmth in the bass. I was mm. like, oh, well, let's just put a nice warm mm. shelf filter in yeah. <laughs> it's odd you it's not a common control to find just something mm. to do a bass boost but at that point it was just like well that's what i want to do so and it's been a sort of thing that's on the new one as well you'll see it's mm. it, with these with this sort of 8-bit synth having that you've got to use it carefully though if you try doing a lead sound with it on you'll have all these little sub harmonics mm. going pop 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 so so it's sort of great if you've got a Big warm bass you want, mm. perfect. But I always say turn it off for leads and high sounds because mm. it, it will sound up nasty. Is there any famous records that are using this or famous musicians who are using the app Megatron? There, there's people that are signed and do film and TV music and stuff. But I, And I have had a few people say, oh, it was in this track or it was in this. Mm -hmm. But I'm terrible at actually <laughs> <laughs> keeping tabs on it. There's not been... There's not been a top ten single where where it's been like oh here's this really loud at Megatron lead sound mm. really. although it could be but I've not been told about it but there are signed artists and people that have, have, mm. have been in touch. Now the other thing that struck me with the with the well it's the same in all your synths also um, your modular gear mm. the control interface is actually 
quite unusual. Mm. And, um, you know, there's been many a synth released over the years which sounds brilliant but is, like, fucking awful to use and it really sort of puts you off. Mm. Mm. Um, now, sometimes, like in the case of the DX7, it sounds so good you just put up with it. Yes. But yeah. in other cases, um, you know, maybe like the, the Korg Trinity, it just, it's so off-putting that you, you know, it never reaches that sort of legendary status. Mm. And I think, you know, as a musician and as a tracker designer, you know, the interface is just as important as the sound. Mm. So my, my question to you is, you know, how did you come up with this and how did you think about the interface design? Uh, so originally, those these, these two knobs here mm. um, were going to be uh, hexadecimal physical encoders, you know, like rotary switches, mm. rotary switches that, st that stop in a st step. And that's how it worked originally, uh, with my first prototype. You'd, you'd clunk them around mm. to the step you'd want. And then you'd have the pots up here, which were always the, the filter, all the things you need to get mm. to all the time were always going to be yeah. there. And then it, it naturally expanded beyond six controls that I wanted to have on the pots. So then mm. I created the bank button to, to go between green mm. and red. Then it was like, well, we really need to be able to do presets. And if you have a preset, then, and you've got physical hexadecimal mm. encoders here, unless you mo get by motorized hexadecimal <laughs> yeah. encoders, they're not going to be in the right position mm. when you load the preset up. So then it was like, oh, well, let's try rotary encoders and put little LEDs around. And mm. that was, there was, so the first 130 units used um, built-in LEDs around here that, mm. that was an actual product that could be bought. And then I made 500 of them and I bought five, uh, well, 1,000 of those LED rings. Mm. And they came and they were, they didn't work. I had to get my money back. They, they, <laughs> they'd used the wrong type of plastic. So, so you couldn't, though they were working, mm. you couldn't see out of them. They didn't, <laughs> oh, no. So they put basically uh, put far too much uh, white in the, the lens part. Oh, so so the, the, what, it just absorbed the whole light. Uh, so mm. the, I, I've, I've installed one of these. I can barely see it. Mm. You know, even with all the lights out, I can't see it's on. So I said, well, okay, great. But can you send me ones that work? And then it, that didn't they, happen. They just went quiet. They, they went quiet. They did, I got them the money back, luckily. Um, and then I had to... So I think your one and most, the 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 the, the, may, the majority of them actually have a replica circuit board in place that um, has just little um, surface mount LEDs in in the right positions. Yeah, I mean this is quite brilliant though because anyone who's used an app Megatron might have tried the app Mega Drum firmware. So the the sixteen positions actually then become quite a neat Roland style yeah the sixteen steps step sequencer which is. Mm quite intuitive so what you're saying is that you know this super easy to use interface actually was an accident in a way mm, yeah yeah it, it felt like the easiest way to get to the more in-depth parameters and then it, it it just was the first christmas after i'd launched it i was just like oh look let's i can turn it into a drum machine too mm. uh and it just went from there it just became more, more and more apparent but what i want with the two the thing that was always a problem, and uh, I've had, was the overlays. So the drum mm. overlay, well, all the overlays. Mm. I started off with very nice vinyl overlays with screen printing, but they were really expensive and they wanted large minimum quantities. Mm. So then I switched to laser cut card, which was nicer, but I've had people say they don't really like the quality because you mm. get the burnt edges around the card. Mm. It doesn't yeah. cut clean. You get sort of little laser burns around the edges. Mm. Also, card can be bent. Uh, the print quality, because to get the price down, I had to go with a very cheap printer, which wasn't particularly sharp. It was an ongoing nightmare. So the whole point of this is you've now got screens there, and you yeah. load the firmware, and the screens will change. Mm -hmm. Same screen here, screen here. Mm. Everything you need is on the screens, so no more overlays. How many did you sell of the OG uh, at Megatron? Uh, I think it was 130 of the original and then i did a batch of 500 so okay uh i feel like there might be some more somewhere as well <laughs> yeah i like between six and seven hundred yeah six and seven hundred with a uh, yeah yeah around that that's, era uh, that's uh, pretty uh, good. area yeah yeah and it's interesting to think that you design this while like having a full-time job more or less in between your tv stuff. well i was doing freelance mm. stuff at by that point so i was splitting it maybe 50 50 
Mm. So I was freelance, but yeah, I was having, I was trying to like work on programming a game show in studio, mm. but then I'd be having a call with the the, the CAD designer about you mm. know what aesthetics I wanted on the box. Mm. That was the only person I do everything, but the, apart from the CAD, it's fine to do CAD when you're just doing a Eurorack module because it's kind of two D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but when you do this and you've got so many different materials, you've got the wood and everything. Um, it's just really good to have someone whose job is CAD to, mm. to, to do that side of it. And they, he's brilliant. He thinks up all these things mm. that I, you know, I, I could have got to production and not thought of. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, he, he was very good. And he, he's responsible for the, well, less so the look mm. for this one, because this was actually based around an off-the-shelf box, yep. which we just modified for our needs. But this, this one, the new one, is our, completely mm. our own design. Uh, and we created this aesthetic. When you see the keyboard mm. one, the, the keyboard has the mm. same aesthetic as this. Yeah. Um, and even when we go to the modules, it will it will all tie in. You know, it will have that same aesthetic mm. with the modules as well. There's other much larger companies, and and one we've spoken about in the past is obviously Beringer. So, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know, this is quite a unique and innovative design, and and you put a lot of time and effort in. But mm. you know, Beringer is you know actively cloning and and ripping off designs, not only from the likes of of, of Korg and and Roland, but mm. also from smaller company yeah i thought they did an intelligel one recently didn't they? obviously there's the famous story with the the uh, circuit tester which yeah was uh, like they just completely copied it <laughs> and the um the arturia key step they yes directly that copied that yeah um, how would you feel if beringer came out with a a, a version of the at megatron and uh i mean they might do that that at megatron possibly it's that they do stuff that's very safe. Mm. They do. They wouldn't do something that that is so. They might do it, but it is. It's a very niche sound. It's like a popularity contest with them, like mm. uh, uh, <laughs> Uli's ego boost for the uh, whatever. Mm. <laughs> what what, what mm. synth clone is going to boost my ego the most? Right. Um, and uh, I just don't think that would tick the box, and I don't think this one will ever be done because uh, well, you might. You might be able to clone it as a single board design and mm. make it entirely digital off a very powerful processor. But the whole point of this is it's modular. So, oh, I screwed this thing up. I meant to keep it open. Anyway, mm. inside just this one mm. is one, two, three, four, five circuit boards. Mm. Inside the full side keyboard one is, I think it's 19 mm. circuit mm. boards, which is just ridiculous. Mm. Uh, uh, you would have two maybe three circuit boards in a synth normally. Um, mm. So by having that many circuit boards, it just makes it completely prohibitive to, to churn out um, from mm. somewhere like their company. They just, mm. they, they'd have to redesign it as a single board design or sort of dual board design. Mm. It, just, it wouldn't, there's no trick in the book that would allow, allow them to, to build this in this way. So, <laughs> so I think, yeah. I think I've, rather than using patents and things, I think I've protected this one by mm. making it so ridiculously complex to manufacture. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy with this one. Uh, but yeah, that one is up to them, but I just can't, it's not their style, I think. I think it's, uh, mm. it's not, not safe enough. I have some bearing since I've got their SH-101 clone. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. Now, yeah. you know, that, that cost me like, I think two hundred pounds. Now, if I wanted mm. a real SH one hundred and one, that would be well over a grand. If you can find one in good condition. Weirdly, know. when I wanted to buy an SH one hundred and one in the late nineties, mm. they were two hundred pounds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, like, I remember I, knew, I, was, I was like that close to buying one, but I went with the Juno instead. Yeah, well, I was in a similar <laughs> position and ended up buying a Novation base station, which I, which well, I was very happy with it. Now I sort of regret I should have got an SH one hundred and one, mm. but. You know, some people say, well, Beringer is democratizing hardware. You can buy an SH101 for 200 quid. You can buy a 303 for 80 quid. Mm. Like, isn't that an amazing thing? I, I don't think I worry ever that much about the, the replica old synths. It's, it's copying modern synths that are in production, like the IntelliGel module, the Arteria stuff that, that is... That, that, that those companies would have spent an absolute fortune on R&D recently. 
Mm. They won't necessarily got their money back, but oh, the key step they probably have because there's so many out there. Mm. But uh, it's it's more the the principle of the thing. There's a difference between between uh, between being legal and being doing the right thing. Mm. And he even says in in interviews, he goes, "Well, I'm not going to talk about the morals. I'm just going to say that w- everything we do is done within the law." I mean, it occupies a sort of a grey area in a way. Corgood have got an MS20. Um, their MS20 Mini and uh, Beringer have their um, their their clone. Mm. Now, surely you would say, well, Korg must have the patent on the MS20. Now, yeah. Beringer is such a large company; they're quite difficult to challenge legally. I know it's 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 basically all about aggression. What frustrates me with the bigger companies is that they're now having to waste money fighting them for their IP. And that could be money spent on creating new, interesting stuff rather mm. than fighting for the old IP on old stuff. It's just it just makes for a really horrible atmosphere in in the industry. That that it's it just turns it into a horrible legal show, and it shouldn't mm. be about that. Engineers pride themselves on developing things and moving things forward, and I, I don't feel they go that far with that. They claim their iterations on uh, on classic synths but you know whacking an effects chip on something it's hardly it's hardly create inventing the Fairlight, mm. is it or inventing mm. the D- dx7 that that is real creation that's that's mm. those are the people we should be hailing as heroes mm. but there's probably people who will buy them i don't mind too much I, I can imagine me as a student being very excited about ba- being able to buy a very cheap version of a synth that's regarded as a classic i can imagine me being that person but i've been very fortunate i've worked in Recording studios where I've got to use the real classic synths, mm. um, like for hours and hours and hours. So that that's not something I feel the need for anymore. Mm. I don't need to play on any mm. of these synths anymore. Um, it would do absolutely nothing for me to buy one of them. But I I would still get a lot of pleasure playing from you know if someone said brought me you know a Yamaha CS80 and said look this is this CS80 it's got all this history behind it it was used in this studio on this mm. song you know that would really give me a lot of pleasure to play mm. that and to use it and you know it would have a lot of nuance to it that, that a modern clone mm. wouldn't ever be able to get close to because you're you know they try and clone the pure out the factory synth mm. not not the thing that's been toured for years or been sat in the studio for years but that is what makes the sound of these old synths it's the the slow detuning of the oscillators and the wearing of the components that's what makes them good i think people do forget that a little bit in contrast to Beringer, Roland are, are, are taking another approach, which is a bit controversial, although not in the same way. So mm. since the late 90s, they've been pushing this digital modelling agenda. Um, people are crying out for them to recreate their classics. They're refusing, which mm. is quite interesting. But they're saying, well, we've got this other synth, which has the sounds of a, a 909. Yeah. In They had a kind of a, a very stale period where they were releasing things like the Juno D. Yes. Um, Oof, yeah. You know, I struggled you... a lot with that. Like, and wasn't there, was there one called a Jupiter? It looked a bit like a Jupiter, but it was looked like mm. <laughs> it was the most horrific thing, horrible preset machine when you turned it on. Yeah, yeah, there was a, quite a few weird synths like that. I think they're starting to release interesting st- stuff. Some of the boutiques are good. Mm. If you were in charge of Roland, let's say what Mm. what would you have them develop well i think there there's a very interesting point well first of all Mm. uh there's a lot of stuff that i don't know the answer to which Mm. is does roland have the manufacturing capabilities to take take on bayringer and release a clone at the same prices or do they not have that capability i'm not sure what their name would add on to it to, to be cloning old synths i mean would you uh, if they did bring out an identical clone of an 808, but it was twice the price of the Bayringer, which would you go for? I, mm. uh, on the basis they're both clones. Clo- cloning is like just it's just a different league of simplicity compared to creating a mm. new synth. <laughs> uh, mm. and you can put all the components in the mm. right order. The, the, all the schematics are online. Mm. And anyone can do it. The problem comes in when you've got very rare components, and especially the digital, 80s digital components that now need modern replacements because they were using chips that were very, very custom mm. and can't be recreated again. 
Um, that's where it gets complicated. But 70 cents are generally off the shelf components in, in a lot of them are, a lot of them are with, with only a few things that are hard to source. So I think my, my, my thing would be like, don't go with either. Don't go with the Roland version or the Roland. Mm. Build your own. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the schematics are there. Components, get on Mauser. <laughs> Order those components, make it yourself. Mm. <laughs> now let's talk a bit about the, the future now then, because, you know, we, we broached that a little bit now. So in the current market, who do you think is really innovating? What, what, what sort of modern sense are the, the ones that you would buy if you could? Um, well, I was saying earlier, the Obine 2 Voice Pro was a synth that I first played on in 2017. Mm -hmm. And that isn't really innovating that much, but it really is just the absolute best classic vintage, but modern two voice synth. Uh, it, it's very expensive. Uh, I think I would like one, but, but that's not really, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a modern version of a, his classic 70 synth. Uh, innovating stuff. I think I think that Hydra synth looks very interesting. The problem is that I haven't been to a synth show for two years because of mm. the pandemic. So normally I'd be going around playing all these. So all I've got is audio demos I've heard on YouTube and uh, press releases. So normally I can be going, wow, mm. I've played on this, it's brilliant. But that really isn't the case. It's stuff that looks like it could be good. Modal always do interesting stuff. I know the guy... Um, that does nano loop he's done his own hardware synth recently yeah that's right i seriously want to get one of those uh quite affordable as well yeah that's that looks interesting the thing is I, I meet a lot of people from the modular world and that's where things generally are, are developing first so you mm -hmm. know um like bastos stuff yeah future sound systems endorphins they're they're all people that are doing proper innovation you know, that's where it'd be good to focus. It's a shame that all these companies can't do, because it's still pretty niche, you mm. I know a lot of people do have, you know, like yourself, mm. you know, it's too irresistible not to just have a little rack of mm. modules to play <clears throat> with, even though you it might not be where you're normally. Well, it's as you say, like certain things. Well, why I wanted to get a Eurorack, I really wanted an endorphin, endorphins module. Mm. And that's only available as Eurorack. There's nothing else like that on the market. You sort of, yeah, it's interesting what you say. I hadn't really thought of it like that. Like the real innovation is happening there. If you want something fresh and new, then that is, is where it is happening. Mm. I think that's where where a lot of the development is, ha is happening. I feel like the keyboard synths people do and this is one of the things I'm hoping with the keyboard version of this, people um, can see that, wow, this is a keyboard synth that is completely new and interesting mm. and has a very different thing. The problem is when you do a keyboard synth, you have to sink so much money into R&D that everyone gets a little bit scared and it all gets a little bit, mm. oh, we've got to make it like a classic synth because, because it's such a huge investment. Mm. Everyone can get a little bit nervous. Um, obviously, I've sunk three or three and a half years or something into mm. this and mm. I don't I don't want to know how much money into I mean there's been a lot of revisions mm. three complete revisions a mm. uh, huge amount of time but then again I'm in a privileged position that I've got freelance work mm. that I can just keep churning away at the freelance work and that can get this until this is absolutely mm. bang on I think modules are probably more innovative than the keyboard synths at the moment, but I'd really like that to change. Because mm. I think there's, there's a, I think it's completely possible for something to come out. I'd love there to be a, a synth, and maybe super in September, mm. maybe I'll go around and I will play on a keyboard synth and that will really blow my mind. Mm. <laughs> That's what I'd really like. Well, let's talk about this beauty here. So, this uh, OG at Megatron, this is uh, my unit. And as I say, I'm really pleased with the kind of gritty, sort of gnarly sound. Mm. Just had a mess around with this. And it really is like the next level in innovation. I mean, even visually, you can see, you know, it's got this nice angle case, matte black. You've got these OLEDs here. But the sound as well, it, it does so much more than this, this could. 
Like, can you tell us like some of the improvements and you know what what this will give like a, a prospective owner? Yeah. Well, the first main thing is that all the firmware is on the SD card, so there's no more changing firmware via a cable. Mm. So you can flip between you know the Aussie Tron and the Atmegatron at a click of a button. No more mucking about with cables. Um, but then the 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 ATX I call it mm. software, which is kind of based on the Atmegatron, it has its own extra features now. Mm. So uh, it has a chain, it has the sampling of the Ossitron. It's got the different audio resolution selection that was locked at thirty two sample wavetables. This can go from sixteen to one hundred and twenty eight. Got a wave warper. It's built on built on that quite mm. substantially, and then we've got. Um, you know, other ones we're working on, like the drum synth and a uh, thing for doing the Corgan one, piano and organ, and some of the classic ones. There's a um, Bezier synth that I've been working on. I, d I don't know when that will be ready, but mm. that's like a whole new sort of synth based around a uh, system of <laughs> creating mm. points, and it then does a curve around the points. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Just like you do, you know, in Adobe Illustrator, if you're creating mm. a path, I was like, oh, well, you know, you create your points and you create your curve. Mm. What would that be like if you did that in the synth? So mm. something I'm working on. And then it's got the built-in sequencer as well. So you can, again, using the micro SD, you can take MIDI clips in and out mm. and play play them on the different sounds. And furthermore, I mean, there's actually two synths in it. Yeah, right? that's two at Megatrons there. You, mm. Each of those is a... You've also got the Eurorack interface as well, so for each synth. So yeah, you've basically got two two synths in this one, eight synths mm. in the keyboard one. So that's the App Megatron two. What are you going to call the keyboard one? Uh, I think it's still going to be the App Multitron, uh, right? Thing, because it's eight synths, uh, and then an eight voice filter card and an eight voice ampl amplifier card that has built in effects that can mm. be downloaded onto the uh, onto the chip. By adding the analog filters, it really comes into its own uh, and really makes for something very special mm -hmm. um, uh, and the, the built-in effects you know is really nice mm. as well uh, and having it as a proper keyboard synth and do you think you'll do a euro rack style um, module of, of the app megatron 2 yeah the whole thing is internally is is can be thought of as modules so this is a uh, it will be a euro rack system based around this section here so mm. everyone would need a controller unless you already own the App Megatron 2, if you were pure Eurorack, you'd need to get the controller module. Mm. Then these are the voices, so all of these are modules, mm. and then the filter and the ampl amplifier will also be module modules as well. But there is also this thing called the ATX bus, mm -hmm. which passes the data from the controller along to all the modules, mm -hmm. as well as the audio, eight-channel audio, will be passed from module to module. So it's a, a bit like Eurorack Plus. It can integrate with normal euro rack but it's its own little thing as well really cool i think we we said before that dance music is quite inherently nostalgic it was even in the beginning um mm. because it was based on sampling older stuff and uh, if you listen to stuff from the 90s there's the sampling sounds from the 70s and 80s yeah even now people crave like that thumping 909 kick I do have the feeling that it's very hard to identify eras anymore, like mm. the 70s, 80s, 90s, and to a certain extent, the early noughties, you could listen to any song in, say, the decade. Yes, yeah. Now, I don't think that's really possible anymore. Mm. Uh, you can listen to a song made in 2020 and compare it to one made in 2010. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it sounds so similar that you, you couldn't, you couldn't say the decade. Mm, um, mm. What I'm getting at is that new technology shapes sounds. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think is going to be coming out, which will be the next era of musical evolution? There, there is this big sort of um, thing around the FPGA sense, mm. uh, but I'm yet to hear something on that that really completely makes you go, this is something new. It's really difficult to know what that's going to be. Uh, I mean, when you've got all these huge stepping stones, you know, you've got the, the mini mode, then you've got the Prophet 5, 
then you've got the Fairlight, then you've got the DX7, mm. it, like these, these absolutely massive st stepping stones, and each time you hit them, it's, it changes everything. I wonder if they, there is that possibility with FPGAs that it could do something, but the thing is, it's just got to do so... You, there's got to be... Um, there doesn't have to be a need for it, I don't, because I'm not convinced that when they invented the DX7, people wanted it, mm. but there's got to be something that uh that um when it's out there that's so unique and so fresh that that everyone will then want it mm. and i think that could be the fpga but it's they they've got to use fpgas in a way that is just totally unique and it, it, again it can't be just a box ticking synth of of analog virtual analog or mm. or sampling or anything like that uh, it, it it must be something unique Mm. And I think it could happen. I don't think it's happened yet, but um, I think there is a potential there. Mm. That would be the one thing that I would say. But I, I just I don't know what that is yet. I don't know mm. what what that sound is. But mm. it will be good when it happens. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, uh, thanks a lot for your uh, time. Mm. Check out the at Megatron Two. This is going to be first shown at Superbooth in September. Mid September, yeah. When yeah. do you think it's going to hit the streets? Maybe for Christmas, I think. I've got to get. There's still a. I've got all a, a few demos units, mm. but manufacturing the cases, you know, it takes a very long mm. time. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 go for that. But I've been trying to avoid the. the I kept on saying, oh, release date a few months mm. after whenever I was asked. And now <laughs> I, I just felt this is silly because it was making mm. me really stressed out. So I stopped, stopped mm. the guessing. But I th if I have to guess, I guess at the end of the year. Well, thanks a lot to Paul for being on the channel. I put a link to Salisbury Synth in the description, so check that out. And all those young synth engineers, think about what Paul has to say. Let's try and make something really new and innovative. If you like this interview, smash that like button. Maybe even subscribe if you fancy that. And I hope to see you in another video soon. Take care.